Hello and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report, perspective and news progressives can use. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It is November 8th, 2019, and in this episode, we're going to discuss 11,000 scientists standing firm, the recent ACA lawsuit, DNA in the Fourth Amendment, and billionaire bills politics. So let's just dive in. Uh, on Tuesday, a report titled World Scientists Warning of Climate Emergency was published in Oxford Academic with over 11,000 scientists signing on. It's a detailed report full of data visualization over the past five years to show how humanity is simply not doing enough to prevent our destruction. The report took a deeper perspective than most climate change information reported. That's because the crisis is usually presented on just global surface temperatures, right? The, the rising of, of the temperature of the Earth, which this report calls an inadequate measure to capture the breadth of human activities and the real dangers stemming from a warming planet. They provide 32 comparative data points in the study, some of which are incredibly depressing, uh, while others are, are really interesting. So, and I wanna begin, let's review some of those data points. Uh, all of these are over the past 30 years. The human population has increased 15.5%, while the amount of children being born per woman has decreased 10.9%. Tree loss is up 49.6%. Now, keep that in mind, right, when we hear all this exciting news about countries planting trees. I mean, it is good news. It's exciting. Um, but we're just making up for the past mistakes. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is up by 4.98%, methane up by 3.65%, and nitrous oxide up by 2.46%, all of these contributing to the surface temperature increases that we've been experiencing. Now let's not forget that the past five years have been the hottest years on record globally. My bet is that 2019 is going to continue this trend. Antarctica has lost 1,230 gigatons of ice over the past 30 years. A gigaton is a billion tons, and it's often used when discussing human CO2 emissions. Um, this is roughly the mass of all land mammals, uh, other than humans, in the world. The, the study also points out that extreme weather events are up 43.8% over the last 30 years, which makes us have to question the actual definition of extreme at this point. It's unlikely that we're ever going to get back to the enjoyment of predictable and modern weather events uh, of the past ever again in our lifetimes. Um, the, these extreme you know, weather events are, are the new norm. The list goes on, and, and as always, I'll provide full sources in the description below so you can check out the data on your own. The report presents a number of solutions that you know, we should take very seriously. So for example, uh, on energy, they talk about how the world must quickly implement massive energy efficiency and conservation practices and replace fossil fuels with low carbon renewables and other cleaner sources of energy if safe for people in, in the environment. They continue to say that we should leave the remaining stocks of fossil fuels in the ground and should carefully pursue effective negative emissions using technologies such as carbon extraction from the source and capture from the air and, uh, and especially by enhancing natural systems. It also talks about how wealthier countries, uh, which means us you know, here in the United States, uh, need to support poor nations in transitioning away from fossil fuels. So again, we have another instance of uh, climate scientists recommending a much more aggressive and bold approach to climate action in terms of infrastructure development than our politicians and our elected officials are promoting. Uh, well, with the rare exception of some, like right, Bernie Sanders is, is big on his green energy infrastructure plan. The plan also calls for an immediate reduction of short-lived pollutants, such as methane, black carbon or soot, and hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, if we can do this, we can actually potentially reduce short-term warming by over 50% in the next few decades. The report suggests that eating mostly plant-based foods uh, will help reduce the global consumption of animal products, especially ruminant livestock, and, and that can improve human health and significantly lower GHG emissions, including uh, methane and the short-lived pollutants that we talked about. And I think, you know, look, we have to face the facts. If you're a hardcore climate activist uh, or just someone who doesn't want to see their kids grow up in some dystopian future and you're still eating meat, you're part of the problem. We have to be willing to change, and, and by that I mean you and I. Going vegetarian is a lot easier than you think, and you'll feel better. Seriously, consider it. If not for you, then for the rest of humanity. It's really easy to say you're, you're for climate action and things like that, but it's much more difficult to be a part of the solution. 
The scientists demand an economic shift away from the excessive extraction of materials and overexploitation of ecosystems and towards the long-term sustainability of the biosphere. So uh, really reducing our mineral extraction, our uh, energy extraction like oil, uh, gas. And they also suggest a method of voluntary population control. Today, population is increasing by roughly 80 million people per year, uh, or more than 200,000 people per day. And the world population must be stabilized, and ideally, gradually reduced, within a framework that ensures social integrity. They suggest policies like making family planning services available to all people, removing barriers uh, to their access, and achieving full gender equity, including uh, primary and secondary education as a global norm for all, but especially girls and young women. This suggestion is something rarely spoken about. It's, it's so taboo even in modern society. It's biological, right? We are programmed through millennia of hardship to want to reproduce. It was part of the survival of the species. Throw in our religious, our social, our parental influences, and, and you introduce a whole new level of pressure to reproducing. Uh, but the report suggests by opening up access to family planning and education, um, these two things have his historically been tied to uh, some of the fastest ways to reduce reproduction rates. It's one of the reasons that authoritarian and theocratic governments tend to prevent the women in their society from becoming educated. It's to keep them servile to the male population. It has to stop. In the end, scientists discuss how they're encouraged by the progress so far, but there is so much work to do. And we hear, you know, we hear about it all the time. It's nonstop, but we can never forget that this is the most important fight of our age. It doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you are on. Uh, the climate crisis threatens everything you know. So again, be sure to check out that report below. I, I thought it was super interesting. Um, moving on, this past Monday, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities released a detailed report about the potential consequences of a new lawsuit. The Trump administration and 18 state attorneys general are asking for the courts to strike down the entire Affordable Care Act, uh, otherwise known as the ACA, as unconstitutional. According to the report, if the lawsuit were to succeed, 20 million people would lose their health insurance and millions more would face higher costs for health insurance or health care. But there would be some winners. Um, removing the ACA would cut taxes sharply for the highest income Americans and certain corporations. It unmasks the lawsuit for what it is. It is another attempt to transfer wealth from the lower and middle class to the wealthiest Americans. Let's take a moment to review what would actually happen if we repealed the Affordable Care Act today. Households with incomes over $250,000 per couples or $200,000 for singles um, would receive tax cuts of about $45 billion per year. Um, this is about equal to the amount of capital that would be removed from the working class people when 6.2 million people lose their insurance. Uh, most of these cuts would go to households with incomes over a million dollars per year uh, and would receive tax cuts on averages of about $46,000 a piece. Uh, the 1,400 highest income taxpayers, so the, the wealthiest 1,400 families in the United States, essentially one in 100,000 households with annual incomes over $53 million a piece, they would receive tax cuts totaling about $3.8 billion. Pharmaceutical companies would pay $2.8 billion less in taxes each year, even as seniors would pay billions more for prescription drugs because eliminating the ACA would open up the quote-unquote donut hole gap in Medicare's prescription drug benefit. So a quick recap, the 1,400 wealthiest Americans with annual incomes over $53 million receive $3.8 billion in tax cuts, pharma companies pay almost $3 billion less per year, and 6.2 million Americans would lose their health insurance. These impacts are created through the eliminating of revenue sources tied to the ACA, the Affordable Care Act law. Uh, for example, those laws are a Medicare tax on high earners. The ACA imposed a 0.9% tax on earnings over $250,000 for couples uh, or $200,000 for singles, uh, with the proceeds going to the Medicare trust fund. Um, there's a Medicare net investment income tax. Uh, the ACA also imposed a 3.8% tax on unearned income, which is counted as capital gains, dividends, taxable interests, and royalties for couples with incomes over $250,000 or, again, uh, over $200,000 for single people. Uh, and there's a pharmaceutical company fee, which is the ACA imposed a $2.8 billion annual fee on pharmaceutical companies allocated based on their sales of brand name drugs.
At the same time, at least 5 million seniors would pay at least $1,000 more per year on average for prescription drugs. Now you'll note that the majority of money was being collected as a fee on billion dollar pharmaceutical companies and the taxation of capital gains, a form of income that only the already wealthiest enjoy to a high extent. And I, I wanna make a quick note on capital gains tax for those who are unfamiliar. Capital gains are one of the most significant areas of inequity in the United States. The problem with capital gains, that is to say like making money off of money, is that it does nothing to fund the productive agenda of society. Part of the larger progressive project that we have to be working towards is tying finance to the real economy. Now, I don't believe speculation and investment deserve an outright ban as they would under, like, for example, a completely socialist system, like a revolutionary just shift. Um, I think they both have a place in society and can work to innovate in directions without the consensus of the majority. But the ability for Wall Street bankers and firms to generate capital through the algorithmic manipulation of stock trading adds no value to the world outside of enriching the very small few. Um, Democrat, Republican, Independent, it doesn't matter. These types of policies are incredibly damaging to the vast majority of Americans. We forget that the stock exchange was founded to fund the productive agenda of society. Um, but right now, over 80% of the wealth that's created in Wall Street stays in Wall Street. So, uh, and it's also taxed at a lower rate than traditional income, right? 15% uh, compared to, I believe, the 37-ish percent uh, that most of us get taxed at. The revenue raised through the ACA's taxes on high-income people and corporations help pay for Medicaid expansion to low-income adults. Again, this is a nonpartisan issue. We're talking about giving corporations and the ultra-wealthy more money, money that we're already legally collecting, so we're giving it up, and paying for it by cutting medical access away from our most vulnerable. As progressives, this is the message that we need to be getting across. It's, it's not about being conservative or liberal. It's about policies that negatively impact the majority of Americans and prey on the poor with the intent of making the rich richer. It's a strategy that takes a page from Bernie Sanders, but one that needs to be incorporated into every movement at every level of government. Progressives must shed the labels of the past and the baggage that comes with them. November 5th, there were nationwide elections, and we saw the strategy work in the deep red state of Kentucky, where Democrats recently unseated a longtime Republican governor, and their strategy was all about talking about how his policies were hurting working class families. Now, one of the central arguments of the lawsuit is that when Congress eliminated the ACA's individual mandate penalty, uh, which was the law's financial penalty for choosing not to enroll in health coverage, it rendered the ACA unconstitutional. Now, the argument is, is frankly pretty lackluster. Congress themselves removed the mandate penalty, meaning that it's going to be difficult to argue that it was a core function of the program. If Congress was able to remove it, but keep the rest of the program in place, how could it be that vital to the program? Fortunately, there are legal experts from a variety of political leanings who do not believe of the merits of this lawsuit. I'll quote one of them. Uh, Isla Somnin, a professor of law at George Mason University, called the lawsuit, and I quote, outright ridiculous and goes on to say the lawsuit is weak and deserves to fail. Now, my initial reaction when reviewing the report was kind of a mix of disgust, disbelief, and fear, right? This is just another step towards solidifying oligarchy in the United States, one that dismisses any pretenses associated with helping the lower and middle class. They're not even faking it anymore. They're just going right for the jugular, and it's, it is a directly and unapologetic wealth transfer. But as with everything else in the universe, where there is bad, there is good, right? In this case, the extremely negative provides progressives with a new opportunity to base build. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but, but I want to repeat. Every person you talk to, every person you talk to politics about, your family members, they should understand the consequences of the ACA repeal. Talk to your parents about it, talk to your friends about it, to their family, to everyone. Republican or Democrat, it does not matter people will suffer under this bill. That is, of course, unless they're very rich, uh, and then they'll gain massively. The progressive project needs to transcend the left-right paradigm that we have all inherited, right, through our existing in, in just this point in time space. Of course, this is easier said than done given the political climate and, and more importantly, the established political machines that, that fuel themselves on the donations of corporations and, and special interest groups. Um, but it's actions like these that you know, have to make you take a step back and realize just how deeply entrenched 
Uh, we are in a class war at this very moment when lawmakers who are supposed to represent the interests of their constituents are supporting a rollback of medical care and access for the poor and elderly. We have lost whatever hope of good faith we could have had left. It's my humble opinion that many of the ultra wealthy believe that the climate crisis is going to cause untold miseries uh, on the people. And, and they're involved right now in, in hoarding as much wealth as possible to help weather the storm uh, when it hits. Every day is an opportunity for us progressives to base build. Don't take it for granted. Even if you sit on the sidelines for most political activity, this is something that you want to be involved in. Now, moving on, last week, a Florida detective announced at a police convention that he had obtained a warrant to penetrate GED Match and search its full database of nearly 1 million users' DNA profiles. This comes after the two largest sites, Ancestry.com and uh, 23andMe, have long pledged to keep their users' genetic information private, and a smaller one, GED Match, which I just talked about, uh, is severely restricted police access to its records uh, this year. Aaron Murphy, a law professor at New York University, talks about how big a game changer the, the warrant is. The company is saying the company made a decision to keep law enforcement out, uh, but that has been overridden by a court. It's a signal that no genetic information can be safe. DNA policy experts right now are, are saying that this decision by the courts is going to open up other agencies to begin making these kind of requests and, and getting this information. And, and this matters for everyone. Even if you've never used one of those commercial DNA testing sites, I, I haven't personally, um, it's because there are emerging forensic techniques now that make it possible to identify your DNA profile through distant family relationships. So it's a prime example of a technology arriving into society before we as a collective population have mentally matured to deal with the consequences. The results of these DNA acquisitions have been positive. Genetic genealogy has been used to identify suspects and victims in more than 70 cases of murder, sexual assault, and burglary. And that's, that's kind of the scary part, right? Despite the obvious and scary privacy violations, the DNA is being used to solve real crimes and, and impacting real people. It's bringing justice into the world. But how does it tie into our constitutional rights? Well, the fourth constitutional amendment states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizure shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The Fourth Amendment is designed to protect us against arbitrary arrests and is the basis for laws regarding search warrants, stop and frisk, safety inspections, wiretaps, and really any other form of surveillance. It's also central to many other criminal law topics such as like privacy law, for example. So where does our personal DNA fall into the concept of our private property? You know, it reminds me of the movie Gattaca. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you, you totally should. I remember watching it in high school. Um, I believe it was 2002, and my science teacher, Mr. Jones, showed the movie to a class you know, for a dis discussion. And you know, at the time, I, I didn't really think it was relevant to my interests, but now I see uh, Mr. Jones's foresight with showing a bunch of millennial teenagers <laughs> that movie. When our DNA is openly available to the law enforcement, which is really an arm of government supported by and working for the most elite members of society, what does it mean for our freedom to be? The court's decision to allow law enforcement access to these records sets an immediate legal precedence that will likely factor into other decisions. In many respects, the scales have already been tipped. So what's a progressive to do in, in this scenario? Well, we have to really weigh the potential risks and rewards. Um, I'll preface the discussion by proactively negating some of the counter arguments that can be used in absolute defiance of using this technology. Um, and I've seen it applied to other arguments I've made in the past. There is no hope in attempting to deny technology advancements and their use within society. You can scream at the top of your lungs that human DNA should never be used or accessed by law enforcement, but that is an impossible scenario. And it only weakens your actual power to form the way we actually allow it to be accessed. I think this is exactly the type of issue that could be used to promote a deepening of democracy through a more formalized public voting process. 
Of course, this would require secure informational channels to provide accurate information about the proposal um, from multiple perspectives, right? We should always be debating these, these topics from two varying perspectives at least. Um, ideally, having a strong for and a strong against argument and allowing the people to decide. That that's because it's an issue about safety, security, and privacy. And as with any technology, every step forward opens up new pathways for consequences that you know, we don't intend to happen, but they do. Now, we can imagine the argument for supporting the bill might be as follows. We might say, given the potential to solve crimes using the DNA database is so great, and the benefits provided to society far outweigh the consequences of uh, privacy violations. Now, the bill could be structured in a way uh, to only allow for direct searches. We are looking for person X. Do you have their file or any of their relatives? Of course, the relatives kind of peripheral adds a whole element of privacy. You might get caught up in something um, that you're completely unaware of, for example. Now, we should expect the counter argument, right? Law enforcement may say, well, hey, open access will give us the ability to comb through the information and discover evidence for cases that have hit a dead end. Um, and that may be worth it. It's, it's really a question of justice that we have to answer. And this is kind of the deeper philosophical meaning with, with DNA and in our law enforcement is what matters more to us, personal privacy or the facilitating of justice for those who have been victims of grievous wrongdoing? I think it's important to take into account when we, we solve a crime, we have to remember that there are intangible benefactors besides the, the actual crime being solved. Families develop closure. Um, you know, we prevent bad actors who may still be on the rise of, of, from, from acting again within society. So there are intangible benefits. We could require that people whose DNA is being handed over be notified, although you know, I imagine that might negate much of the view of law enforcement of, of using the database. I imagine they want to use it to proactively uh, you know, get criminals, not necessarily let them know that they're coming for them. We may also say through a public vote designated that the DNA may only be used for very specific crimes like murder and rape um, while excluding the majority of other crimes. Now, we could design the bill with clauses specifically stating that if any clause is changed within the bill, it is rendered null and void, requiring a new public vote to approve. Um, that way we kind of prevent a, a, an authoritarian regime, even if they're democratically elected like we have now, from using this uh, for their own personal Ill, you know, Ill means. Now, but going back to kind of deepening the democracy aspect, this type of policy could have also a, a mandatory expiration date, maybe five or 10 years after creation. And the only possible way to continue it is being with another public vote. I mean, do you see where I'm going here? As technology progresses, we're going to need to be able to experiment more with our institutions in every direction of society. And given that technologies present us with rewards and consequences that we rarely understand at full capacity at the time of their inception, we wanna have a backup plan. Democracy provides us that vehicle if we're willing to be creative with how we structure and issue bills moving forward. The biggest aspect of thinking about this issue from a progressive perspective is not allowing our shared history to define our future. Yes, law enforcement has historically abused powers it has been given, um, but that doesn't mean every law enforcement officer has, right? And no, it doesn't always have to be that way. With that said, if we take this technology in its current form and allow law enforcement to have total access, we're probably going to witness abuse in present day. If we approach our discussion from the perspective of privacy at all costs, we could also make some compelling arguments. This is the argument against it, right? Allowing mass DNA scraping is a slippery slope. By granting law enforcement a wide net to collect and analyze DNA data, we are setting ourselves up for potential dystopian future. The problem with DNA and, and its use in criminal justice is that it is so proficient at accurately identifying suspects that in many cases it's used as a piece of hard evidence that is very difficult to refute. But what happens in a scenario where someone's DNA is involved in a crime, but they were not? Right? That could be the planting of DNA as evidence. It could be a criminal setup or other fringe scenarios. It comes down to a question of what happens if we use DNA to convict an innocent person? Now, I'm not a forensic scientist, uh, so I am just imagining the possible, but that would be a pretty damning scenario for the innocent. Since DNA testing has become widely available, it has been used to exonerate 367 people. Um, so it's the opposite side of the same coin, right? If DNA can be used to exonerate people, it can be, by definition, be used to frame people. One cannot exist without the other. Um, and the, the court's decision to open up DNA access, as they already have, could prove a dangerous precedent in hindsight. 
but it's a, a risk we're already on the path towards taking. My perspective, I think law enforcement is overreaching here and will continue to do so. In general, I support DNA testing being used to solve crimes, but I don't believe that giving police access to an entire database of people is the right option in present day. It hasn't happened yet, but police were able to force a warrant through the courts, so it's only a matter of time before the envelope is pushed in that direction. As progressives, we would be well served by organizing conversations about these instances in our local communities ahead of time uh, and forming whether they be local, uh, countywide, or statewide bans on the practice uh, you know, around that if we desire privacy. I mean, the alternative could also be true. Again, I don't when we discuss these things and the objective of thinking progressive uh, at its core is is considering these arguments from multiple perspectives uh, and debating both sides because ultimately they should be decided democratically um, not through a singular power source or a singular elected official as always we like to wrap it up with some technology news and our news today comes in the form of microsoft founder and billionaire bill gates sharing his political philosophy with the world Speaking at a forum uh, in New York with the New York Times writer Andrew Ross Sorkin, uh, Microsoft founder Bill Gates came off uh, you know, far from enthusiastic about uh, Elizabeth Warren in 2020. Speaking about the wealth tax, uh, Gates said there's a limit to what he'd be willing to pay. And I quote, if I had to pay 20 billion, it's fine, said Gates. Uh, but when you say I should pay 100 billion, then I'm gonna start doing a little math to about what I have left over. The Times writer asked Gates specifically who he'd back in the general election, Warren or uh, Donald Trump for president. And despite being a vocal Trump critic in the past, Gates said he would not commit to supporting Warren to defeat the president. He said, I, and I quote, I'm not going to make any political declarations, uh, but I do think that no matter what policy someone has in mind, whoever I decide will have to have the more professional approach to the current situation. Probably is the thing I'll wave the most. And I hope the more professional candidate is the electable candidate. So what Bill Gates is actually saying is, you know, whoever will take the least amount of money from him, which I imagine is how he defines professional, uh, is his candidate. Notice no mention of Sanders, who attacks uh, Gates at an even higher rate than Warren. Um, but I think it goes without saying, if he's not going to support Warren's uh, wealth tax, he's not going to support Sanders. So let me offer a fresh perspective on Bill Gates' voting decision. No one cares. Bill Gates, like every other billionaire, is not going to vote uh, or think with your best interests in mind. Their political opinions should not influence you or anyone you know in the slightest. Why would Bill Gates' vision of the future align with the majority of Americans? His reach is beyond the means of the absolutely vast majority of the American population. He doesn't understand the struggle of the daily grind, of a system that has left so many of us behind, of a future that doesn't center on the transcendence of circumstance, uh, but on one's bank balance. And probably most importantly, he doesn't you know, visualize a future that doesn't center on the transcendence of circumstance uh, beyond one's bank balance. Bill Gates has done a lot of public relations in the past to kind of craft his image, uh, but it's not an image you should give stock to. Bill Gates is not interested in advancing humanity if it costs him a larger portion of his wealth. He's interested in helping so long as it doesn't discomfort him. Don't mistake his philanthropy with some sort of elevation of character or wisdom. It's a tax write-off. It's also money that we as a society could be benefiting from if marginal tax rates were increased to the 70% rates that propelled America into the greatest area of productivity we have ever seen, and that was during the World War II economy. The transformation belongs to the people. Bill's vote has no more value than yours. Never forget that. You are owed as much as a say in this democracy as anyone else. The rules are stacked against you, that is certain but we can change that together. And so our fight continues. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.